Thanks very much. Um, so I'm so you've had updates about the 100K every year, I think. Uh, last year it was uh, um, Mark Caulfield, the chief scientist. So I'm going to whip through the sort of introduction, just for anybody who doesn't know what the 100K is doing, but concentrate mainly on things that have moved on over the last year. So the history, of course, is the genome got sequenced, cost a lot of money, three billion, maybe depending on how you count it back it, in 2000, and if you'd have done 100,000 then, it would have, would have been way beyond any sort of budget. But the price has dropped. This is an exponential graph. It's come down to around $1,000 to do a genome from a billion dollars, which is one of the most dramatic drops of any sort of technology ever. Um, as part of the legacy, of uh, the Olympic legacy, in 2012, the former prime minister announced this project as part of life science strategy, and July the next year, Genomics England was launched as the, en the entity to carry out managing this project. Um, now, what was the project going to do? Well, the focus is on what can it practically do in the health service in terms of using whole genome sequencing for clinical care. There was a set of groups set up by the chief medical officer to you know, look at that and identify rare disease cancer and infections as being the targets. So Genomics England is focusing on the first two, so that's what I'm talking about. So this is, I think people frequently think this is a research project. It's really a treatment project. It's focused on NHS transformation, getting whole genome sequence into standardized care. And Sue will talk more about the future of that afterwards. Um, it's all about doing whole genomes, not exomes, not panels, everything at a high depth, 30x coverage, which means this is a, you know, robust, you can look at every genome and interpret it directly. The timeline I've mentioned, but I think the two things to point out is we did a pilot initially, the pilot was done through the BRCs, but the main project has been done directly involving NHS England. So this project's got a number of objectives, obviously improving healthcare, um, but it's also got to stimulate wealth generation, stimulate a genomics industry in the UK. We're trying to create a legacy of infrastructure just so the NHS is configured in a way that if you think that it's useful to do a whole genome, if you want to commission for a particular activity, the infrastructure is there to support it. And of course, to also think about structuring that in a way which allows research to be done as well, which is the sort of, you know, rather than having two separate worlds, clinical care and research cohorts, try and bring those two things together, given the amount of data that's being collected. So this is what's been set up over the few years. You have little genomics England in the middle. Um, it's, it's went through a process of evaluation of sequencing, ending up with a contract with Illumina. Um, there's a sequencing center um, actually now sitting on the Hingston campus, financed by the Wellcome Trust that Illumina operates out of. Um, then, of course, the other big thing is you need to engage with the patients. That's all been managed through NHS England, setting up genome medicine centers. And so there's now 13 of those genome medicine centers, about 85 hospitals um, scattered across the whole of England. So, and there's now engagement with the other um, countries in the UK. So they all have links now to Genomics England and you know, will become part of this 100K project. Um, you, of course, you've got a lot of data, and that's a key point. How do you handle the data in a way that you can do this clinical care and research? So there's a data center, but it's a government data center in the sense it's scalable, um, managed in a secure location under the G Cloud framework, which is the government way of contracting IT in that sort of framework. Um, so and that sits on essentially the NHS side of the fence in terms of how that data is handled. So you've got data flowing. Um, to Illumina for sequencing, sequencing data going into the data center, phenotype data from clinical care going into the data center as well. In terms of interpretation, then we ran another competition to evaluate different providers for this because rather than build your own pipeline, it's felt that it's best to go and see what everybody else can offer. There's a set of companies that were contracted under that and they operate inside that data center. There's also been a framework using the Innovate UK um, SBRI mechanism to try and stimulate additional activity development of SMEs in this space. So there were a set of grants which have just about come to an end now 
which stimulated some of this. So this is part of setting up a framework to support organizations that can provide services around interpretation, as we're really only just getting started with rare diseases and cancer, and providing a way of stimulating that activity in the UK economy. Of course, the output of all this is to get a clinical report. So this is where we are now, 20,000 genomes sequenced. Um, and now I'm just going to talk about really where we've got to in terms of returning that data. So 20,000 genomes, but actually it's more complicated than that because there's a whole sort of pipeline of where the genomes are. In fact, slides slightly out of sync with the previous one. It's slightly more out of date because it says 15,000 for the actual genomes. Um, there's, a, there's more genomes, more patients that have been consented within the NHS, and there's a lot more genomes sitting here which have been sequenced but haven't got full clinical data and haven't had all the inconsistencies evaluated. And so this is the pipeline here, the numbers going down to us trying to return results on that. So we're getting to a point, we have now got an active production pipeline running. It's only been since really since last August, and it's already returned more than 1,500 reports for families, that is. So this is actually, again, out of date. In terms of genomes, it's more like 3,000 genomes because every family structure, it could be a trio. It's not always a trio, but it's that sort of ratio. So what's getting returned to patients through their clinical care? So obviously, they're being put into the program because they have unmet clinical need around rare disease or cancer, and you're trying to see, can you use whole genome sequencing to improve that care? So the report is not, it's not a whole genome analysis, it's an analysis specifically to address that condition. <coughs> That's the primary findings. There's also an option to have some secondary findings if the patient wants to consent for that. And of course, there's other information that's useful for families if they've got a you know, child with a condition about the future risk if they have any more family members. So this is all linked to a patient panel. Um, so there's very active engagement um, with patients and the public around how this is structured in terms of the consent arrangements. And there's now this panel, but there's also representatives of the panel and all the committees that um, operate to manage Genomics England and the data. Where have we got to in terms of recruitment, in terms of the different disorders? This gives you some idea of the spectrum of different rare disease conditions and how many families and how many genomes are now sequenced. Um, in terms of this interpretation, though, it's now it's a set of constructions. So firstly, there's a set of data models. So this specifies what's um, required to come from the electronic health records out of the EHR um, to support interpretation. Then there's a crowdsourced set of gene panels. You can think of this almost as an evolution of UK GTN specification of panels. We have all these conditions. What's known about which genes have been identified to be involved in that? And that's really being you know, crowdsourced. You can contribute to that if you're an expert in a particular condition. And that leads to us identifying different genes and different variants as having different categories of likelihood of being causal. Tier one and tier two means they're in the gene panels identified with that particular condition. Tier three are everything else which might look highly um, you know, as a possible candidate, but hasn't, you know, research hasn't previously identified it as being associated. You combine that with these interpretation providers who are, you know, automatically ranking the different variants that have been identified. A whole genome's got four million variants, roughly, compared with a reference. So there's a large number of of variants to kind of categorize, to identify candidates that could be causal and the likelihood of that. And all of this is brought together through um, interfaces for the MTPTs in the clinical care system to look at data that's been aggregated and take decisions about what they're going to report. So this is arranged sort of like this. You have the data, it's going to the interpretation providers within the secure environment. It's being passed through, processed through the gene panels to tier the variants, and it's being made available to um, the clinical care system um, through these tools, one of which is this one, which has now gone active. It's been built by Genomics England, but the whole point here is we've got a component model, so we can evolve as new components come along, 
people develop them either in academia or commercial, these can be plugged into the system and it can evolve over time in terms of efficiency. So here you've got, you've got systems so that you view the pedigree, you can download a report, and you can look at individual variants and decide if you believe them as a clinical care individual. So where we go in terms of what's the kind of output, so this, as I said, there's more than 1,400 reports that have been returned. Looking at the first few hundred of those, the kind of rates of return, these are, of course, all patients who have already been through the standard care in the health system, didn't get a diagnosis. So these are the harder cases that are still undiagnosed. Of these, we're getting 20% you know, or more in this sort of first automatic phase being identified as you know, real likely causal variants, another 10% of the possible. Um, so, but this goes up as you get clinicians looking at the detail, the in information in more detail. Um, so there's a few examples of um, cases. So here's one, um, Georgia, um, four-year-old now, and it's the identification here is a completely new gene which wasn't recognized before as being involved in this disease. There's nothing here that really is known as a particular action ability, other than, of course, you can inform the parents of subsequent risk, which is very low. Um, this is Jessica, it's been talked about a few times before, um, an unexplained seizure, you know, existing testing didn't identify a gene, but whole genome sequencing identifies a truncation in a novel gene not associated with this, it's involved in glucose transport into the brain, and actually suggests a possible therapy of you know, switching to a ketonic diet, and this seems to have actually improved Jessica's condition. Of course, you can also pass on information. Um, another case is um, a family with one child that died, and it was possible to go and look at what the cause in that um, gene child's genome sequence was, and this identified a vitamin B12 deficiency, and it meant that, in, that the second child that also has this condition has been treated immediately with B12 and is doing well as a result. So these are a few examples out of the large set, but shows that it's not just about diagnosis. There are other possibility for actually you know, identifying novel ways of at least trying out treatments in these individuals and improving their care. Cancer is a different ball game altogether. It's harder to process, and of course, the big problem is how to deal with the samples. The key thing here is that standard processes in the NHS up to now of formal infixation of cancer samples isn't very compatible with whole genome sequencing. And so the process is going on to switch the NHS to a fresh frozen pathway. That's a major undertaking. I'm sure Sue will mention that. Involves you know, changing pathology services, changing theatre processes. Um, but it is you know, getting done, and there's now a, a process being set up to try and do a fast turnaround, because of course, if you're gonna do cancer, whole genome cancer, um, it's only gonna be useful for actionability if you can get the results turned around very fast. In rare diseases, it's, it's not so critical, but in cancer, it's really critical, so we're trying to get this down to four weeks. That's the target. Um, and there's some accelerator centers that have been identified as participating in that early phase. There's around, um, has it gone? Um, there's around 2,500 patients um, who have been enrolled so far in this. There's a distribution of the cancers that have been taken up. And there's also a reporting an initial reporting um, system that's been set up to return results on this. Only a few hundred have been returned so far. And again, it's rather like the rare disease in terms of classifying variants into different groups um, in terms of potential actionability, what we know about whether the variants that have been identified are linked to possible um, effectiveness of, of treatment conditions. Um, so these results that there are re reports that look like this, which look at the variants and will return a result to uh, clinical care teams around the potential um, you know, change in treatments accordingly. And that's integrated with external knowledge bases. So that's how we're setting up this initial reporting phase.
um, and also to clinical trials, because in a lot of cases, you can't cure the patient, patients, but you may be able to induct them into a clinical trial around a new therapy, which is linked to particular genetic uh, conditions. So that's where we are with you know, return of results, which is the big part of this um, program. That's really up and running now in a substantial way and will you know, just accelerate over the months as the, the pipeline becomes more streamlined. Right, so one other thing just to mention, of course, is now we're returning these results on a large scale to the clinical care system. It's important to educate um, you know, the, the 1.4 million people in the health system. And so the, NH, the Health Education England program is a key part of this, is also part of the 100K program to, um, to do MSc courses and other training online um, to upskill um, the clinical care individuals. Now, the other side of all of this is um, research. So the consent that's structured around this program is novel in the sense that it allows return of results, but also allows that data to be used for additional analysis. Some of that analysis is to improve the interpretation for that particular individual, but there's also just basic research as well. So that's always been a part of the program. So you have this system here, which is really just to return results and added on are the ability to do, in, to do research activities. But all of those research activities have to happen inside the data center. Um, so there's a couple of bolt-ons to this. One thing is that there's the standard phenotype information that's collected to allow genomes to be interpreted for clinical care, but there's additional um, information in the health record system that can be extracted to inform um, research activity. And there's an additional sample that's biobanked that's potentially available for additional research. So what are we doing with those kind of things? So firstly, on the data, this shows how much that's already been assembled alongside these records of these you know, 20,000 20, individuals. There's all the HES data that has been extracted through NHS Digital, and there's this long list of targets of data that will be available in this data center alongside the standard data that's being collected as part of the interpretation pipeline. So this gives an idea. This is going to be a very rich research environment because for the first time, you'll not only have a complete genome sequence, <coughs> you'll have this rich phenotype set of data as well, collected directly out of the NHS um, with the possibility to go back and recontact those individuals as well. Um, the biobank sample, things are in this sort of pilot phases going on in terms of looking at those samples and what can be extracted from them. The samples, of course, are being collected as part of the standard clinical care process. So exactly how this will work out in terms of what you can extract for RNA, et cetera, is being explored right now. But the other side of this is verification, validation of variants. There's um, a collaboration with the Mass Phenotyping Consortium. So where there are some very clear, what appear to be clear variants, which are unexplained in terms of how they function, there's um, the option to, to make some CRISPR um, Cas9 mutations in some mice and explore the phenotypes in more detail. So that's the kind of research experimental activities that are getting going. But of course, the largest part of this research is the GSIP, uh, the set of 2,500 individuals who've signed up to be part of different groups working on this data. And they're structured around different GZIP domains. And this sort of just shows some of the new ones that have been created over the last year in blue. <coughs> and the status in terms of planning of their research activities. Now, <coughs> the other side is the, the gene consortium, which is the commercial individuals who are also looking at this data in a sort of preliminary phase um, to see what value can be gained from it. So everybody's working inside up to, up to now. There's not the genes, the GSIP are not in there, partly because of sorting out agreements with funders and universities. But the system that's being put in place to support this, if you think of what's happened up to now with whole genomes and other data like this, it's been distributed. You download it and you work within your own institutions. This is not the case here. It's all being supported within the secure environment. You run interpretation providers there to provide clinical care. You also, that's where the researchers have to operate as well. 
So we have to produce a genomics England, an environment that researchers can operate in effectively. So there's tools around holding that clinical data. At the moment that's held in LabKey, but there's options for things like Transmart being installed in that environment, which many people have been used to for doing a cohort selection, et cetera. The novel thing is probably about how do you handle 100,000 genomes? Um, that just isn't, there aren't databases with that many genomes, all the variants in those genomes. Most of the software systems you know, are, are not able to handle that. Um, up to now, it's really been just a group of files that you've had to process. So there are some novel bits of software. OpenCGA is basically an environment which takes all of those variants and puts them into a framework where you can query them quickly. So that you can ask, what's the distribution of variants for this particular cohort of patients that I'm interested in, compare with another cohort? Or, and so you can ask that really quickly in that sort of environment. But this is under active development, partly sponsored by Genomics England, partly through EBI. Um, people will want some sort of interfaces within that environment to just find out how many genes are, how many genomes there are of particular groups. But I guess a lot of hardcore researchers, it's just going to be a question of what can they run. And so it's a large scale computing environment with the proper sort of systems for distribution, grid engines for running algorithms, et cetera, that people can bring into that environment. Can you take things out of that environment? Well, no, you can't. You can't take data out. And in fact, if you have a request to take some summary data out, you have to go through an airlock mechanism. But again, that's also been put in place a process for evaluating proposals that people have to export information and allow that data to be exported. So that's the kind of environments that have been built up. To kind of summarize it like this, a data center, run clinical apps for clinical care, research apps for research analysis in a single framework with the data all being held on the NHS side. So from the point of view of consent of patients, patients are more comfortable in terms of the public engagement, with the idea that their data is being used for research, but it's not, you know where it is, it hasn't gone somewhere else. This is a reading library. You can come in and look at the data, you can't take it away. And this potentially supports lots of other things. This is a pharmacogenomic certified medicine meeting. Of course, we want to have this data used for other things. You can think of other apps being plugged in linked to decision support systems, querying these genomes because of all this living on the clinical side of the fence in future. But how are we going to operate across the world where if every country operates the same thing, a closed system? Well, there's this thing called the Global Alliance, which is working out how you can federate data. But I think the idea is you can probably exchange information between different environments summary statistics and aggregate that statistics to find new discoveries that you couldn't necessarily find with a single country's cohort, but still do that in a way that doesn't break this idea of sharing an individual's underlying sequence unless they're prepared to consent for that. Um, but I think it gives a way forward for the UK as a whole. Um, this environment is what Genomics England is being used, but it's also what historically has been used by other things like the data archive for statistics. They don't have to worry about return of results, but it, they're operating, many of these social science databases operate in the same sort of way um, of providing for packages, researchers can't take the data away. So this is a new thing for genomics and medicine to get used to, but I think it is probably the way forward. It's what NHS Digital is now talking about for a national platform for all records, um, as a way of supporting, well, the Fire Institute, but of course that's just been announced today being the new Health Data Research UK um, with the new director of Andrew Morris, who's sitting in front. Um, and that's a potential way for this institute not to hold data, but to be able to access data through a similar sort of mechanism. And you can even think about these kind of platforms not just being at a national level, but being at a more local level I'm from King's Health Partners. Everybody in the UK and in, in England is being now organized around these STPs, these regional organizations. All of making that operational for clinical care is going to involve a lot of linkage of that data. Um, and we should try and do analytics on top of that as well. This will be a richer environment, maybe for clinical care 
uh, analytics. But in order to have the consent and the control and make, keep patients happy, we have a local care record which patients are happy with in our local region. We, these can potentially, I think, also become platforms where you can do analytics in these sort of frameworks where you don't take the data, you have to do the analytics within a secure framework. And some of that will, of course, pass up to the national level. So I think this is the sort of summary of the whole where Genomics England and this platform <coughs> has taken us. Um, we have the GMCs, which are kind of an engine for personalized medicine in the NHS, which I'm sure Sue will go into in more detail in the future. The business of extracting clinical information out of the NHS, which is now being done through the GMCs, that's been a big effort. It's not just getting samples, it's getting clinical data. That's helping drive the standardization of secondary care data capture um, so that you can then use that forward both for interpretation but also research. This, using these interpretation services, it's quite hard to use other people's software and make it work in your environment. But we have a framework for doing that now. And so that, coupled with UK government sponsorship of SMEs, we hope this will produce, you know, continues to produce an engine of development of different ways of interpreting things, extending the interpretation for other um, aspects over time. And then this business of this data center design, that this maybe can solve the problem of NHS data not being accessible for research while making patients happy with being able to be, with their data being used in this way. So there's lots of, this is, so this is a sort of summary of the overall project. Um, but I think we'll just say thanks to everybody who's contributed to this so far. A lot of players, there's a large team um, across Genomics England now, more than 100, particularly the bioinformatics team that's developed a lot of this engineering to make the interpretation possible. Um, but of course, there's big teams now across NHS England, Health Education England, and also I haven't mentioned the interpretate the infection work which is going on in public health England. We've got 13 genome medicine centres and we've got a lot of consortia now linked to this programme. So I will stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>